Have you ever wanted to become a coder but didn't know how or where to start? On episode 126 of Veteran on the Move, Army veteran David Molina tells us why he started a nonprofit to help veterans and their families transition to software careers. Welcome to Veteran on the Move. If you're a veteran in transition, an entrepreneur wannabe, or someone still stuck in that J-O-B trying to escape, this podcast is dedicated to your success. And now, your host, Joe Crane. I've been a USAA member for over 26 years. USAA has been alongside my family for my entire military career, including my transition out of the military. In addition to providing great insurance and banking products, USAA also provides a wide range of tools and advice to make your transition from the military a financial success. To learn more, go to veteranonthemove.com slash leaving the military. David Molina is an accomplished military officer, entrepreneur, and self-taught developer. David is the founder and executive director of Operation Code, a coding 501c3 nonprofit that helps active military, Guard and Reserve citizen soldiers, veterans, and their families learn to code and build software to change the world. After a decade of service in uniform, David founded Operation Code when he couldn't use his new GI Bill to go to code school to become a software developer and build his dream web app. All right, David Molina from Operation Code. Welcome to Veteran on the Move. Thanks for being here. Before we get to talking about business and entrepreneurship, why don't you go take us back a little ways and tell us what you did in the Army. I enlisted in 2000, assigned to a civil affairs unit in 2001 uh, when I got back from basic and served there for a few years. Uh, 9-11 happened. I was at Oregon State University at the time at OSU, go Beavs. And I was there in 9-11 happened, enrolled in ROTC and became a, a lieutenant in commissioned infantry in 2004 and served in the 104th Division, mobilized, assigned to the Joint Personal Effects Depot, Casualty Mortuary Affairs in 2007-8, 18-month mission. Came back to the reserves, mobilized again in 2011-13. Same mission, Casualty Mortuary Affairs, this time at Dover Air Force Base. Same organization, this time as the S-230IC. And cumulatively served a little over 13 years. Outstanding. And, you know, who would have thought that civil affairs and casualty and, and mortuary affairs were probably some of the toughest jobs to be in, uh, especially during the Iraq conflicts. I know those guys uh, saw a lot and did a lot of, you know, had a tough job. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. Now, take us a little bit through your transition out of the Army and, and into the civilian world and how you got going on this entrepreneurship thing. Well, I've uh, you know been in entrepreneurship probably since my teens, business with a friend of mine. We had a yacht cleaning business. We cleaned boats, did a bunch of sales stuff when I was young, You know, sort of just hacking, just whatever I could do. Anything but working in the fields, even though I worked in the fields and I loved it. But more recently here in my transition out of the military, I went to a hackathon in 2012. And fell in love with learning about APIs, learning about how this awesome machine could do so many great things and deploy them to the web. And prior to this hackathon, I had only learned really about WordPress and Joomla and Drupal and was sort of limited in terms of my understanding and scope of what can be done, you know, using web technologies. And so I went to this hackathon, I fell in love with it, told my colonel I'm getting out and going back to Portland, buying a house, VA home and wanted to use my GI Bill to go to code school. And that's sort of what led this whole thing to, to build this. I could have used my GI Bill back home and decided to start a company separate from software development in order to pay my way or send myself to code school. So interesting, uh, you know, a lot of these code schools have actually popped up out of necessity because you know, the major four-year university degree is too cumbersome really for what the industry needs right now, which is hackers and coders. They don't need somebody that's taking the poli sci and the English and the required math and the foreign language skills. They just need somebody that can code. And this really is a great opportunity for veterans out there that want to transition into the high tech and, and computer software side of things as coders, because a lot of veterans already have degrees or partial degrees. They're fairly well educated. They've had all this training. They are already got great people skills. All they need is a hard skill like coding to plug right in. And they've got the leadership experience to end up leading coding teams and software teams, you know, they don't really need to go out and get the four-year degree from scratch. You know, even it's a lot, like a lot of veterans had a degree going into it, and then they end up going back and getting another one after they get out because they need to feel like they need a fresh start. So going out and being a coder and a hacker, you know, so to speak, is a great opportunity for veterans, uh, especially on the entrepreneurial side, because a lot of these guys do stuff on their own or build their own teams. 
and find gainful employment or contracting kind of thing. So it's interesting. It's understandable why you can't use the GI Bill for a coding school because all these coding schools kind of pop up overnight and they haven't been around for very long. You know, the, the quote, credibility may not be there for a lot of them. And you know, government moves kind of slow with this kind of stuff. So it is a problem. I mean, it's understandable why you can't use a GI Bill. But So what you started Operation Code out of this problem or necessity that you ran into. So where are you at now with that? We started off with the simple concept of petitioning Congress to be able to use our GI Bill to go to code school. And after numerous conversations with different people in politics and legislative aides, I just sort of got burnt out with sort of trying to fix a slow door government, you know, sort of slow to move on things. And it just became really cumbersome. What we also found out was that there is already a process in play from 1944, a state accreditation process. See, Congress, you know, authorized and empowered the states to credit any education institution that would later be used, a GI Bill or a VA benefits or any education benefits, really. And so they empowered those states. And so we started here in the Northwest. We started working with Coast Schools here in the Northwest and understanding intimately what this problem was and is. And as a result, after 2014 of doing this, you know, my passion has always been sort of learning software development and hacking and building. And so, you know, updating the website led me to sort of mentoring other vets, getting men- pairing software developers with veterans. And as a result, that created the Software Mentor Protégé Program, a very unique program that's only one of its kind in the country for military veterans to learn to hack and code with volunteer software developers, which ultimately led to, well, the fastest way to learn to code especially in my case, has always been software conferences, RailsCon, Ruby on Ails, Cascadia, Ruby. And so we sort of created a scholarship program for veterans to go to these conferences. And we partnered with you know companies and organizations across the country. And so that spun off our scholarship program. And then we've been sort of growing and evolving this thing and sort of like, you know, everything from software mentorship to scholarships to, you know, helping vets review their resumes and help them get connected with companies, which created our fellowship program. We found a lot of veterans who were gone to code school, who were getting out, couldn't find jobs right away. They sort of faced this dreaded two-year junior gap, right? This sort of thing that you have to be in workforce or figure out or freelance for two years before you can get a job at a company. So we created a deploy, a web apprenticeship program to sort of test that model and figure out how do we shorten the time gap between sort of, you know, graduated code school and a junior uh, time gap. So we created this web apprenticeship program called Deploy. And we continue to work with code schools on accreditation and figuring out this model and better, even faster, even though we've built these other programs and services, brought on a ton of more volunteer staff, and ultimately continue to work with code schools insofar as now offering our services to code schools to help them get accredited and move that process faster. Yeah, outstanding, man. That's awesome. I want to talk more about Operation Code here in a minute, but first I want to go back and find out what's really going on in the world of coding here in the U.S. right now. I mean, there's obviously a large demand for coding and there's must be some kind of a shortage for coders because these at a necessity, these coding schools are popping up. And I said earlier, I mean, they don't have necessarily credibility as far as the GI bill and the government to use your GI bill for that. It doesn't mean they're not valid and they're not competent and they're not trustworthy. It's just, they're not a traditional you know, university or approved tech schools at this point. So there's obviously some kind of demand and, and shortage going on here. What exactly is going on out there right now with coding? Um, the exact problem is we have a technical talent shortage in our country. And so we have tens of thousands that graduated computer science programs from Stanford, Oregon State, different schools across the country. And so the HPs of the world, the Intels of the world recruit these guys who have degrees in computer science. The problem is that there's a shortage between those that graduate the colleges in computer science and the demand to just uh, have folks that are technically competent at the organization they belong to which has a vacancy really uh, somewhere in the shortage of 70 to 100,000 plus, you know, sort of vacancies. And so what, what our corporations have done, American companies have done, have relied on government and visa programs to be able to import labor, non-Americans into our country to fill these jobs. And they've been doing this sort of over and over and over and over. And this has sort of been the recipe for our country in terms of our country's policy. So Silicon Valley has been really great at being able to do that. It's gotten a little bit tougher in terms of immigration and visas, but this has sort of been the sort of operation, right? It's been, you know, bringing the labor from abroad. What we have found over the last five, seven years is software developers who either have their own dev shops or work for companies have found it incredibly difficult to sort of review these resumes from colleges and universities with folks with degrees in computer science, it's sort of in theory, and folks that come in for interviews and they're just having a hard time being able to have guys who just can code and build, especially in the last five, seven years. So many of these folks who worked at these companies exited the companies. My friend Michael at Epicotus Code School here in downtown Portland, 
uh, did just that. And he started Epic Coast Coast School with a small class of half a dozen. And it's now ballooned to like, you know, sort of classes regularly throughout the year, a laboratory of like 200 plus coders in training to be able to fulfill this part and be able to fill the nation's technical talent shortage with Americans, folks who are here in our country, guys who are former cooks, baristas, folks who are making sandwiches in the past, works in railroad industry, just really non-coders, non-technical service industry. And so these code schools have been sort of, you allude, have been brought up because of a demand and a need. And so now you have code schools across the country from sort of Portland, Oregon to, you know, Florida, from the Silicon Beach of Santa Monica up north to Chicago and New York, right, with the flat iron codes. And so this has sort of been that growth that has been created. And if you look at, you start assessing sort of how their application system works, it's not necessarily something where it's a resume and you have to fill out some long document, some paperwork, there might be scholarships available. It's all web-based, right? You're applying online. If they feel that you could make, if you would be someone that you would be great for the software industry, then they're going to sort of do an interview, a phone interview, or Google Skype or Skype or Google Hangout. You would somebody in admissions, they sort of assess it on cultural fit and really your own technical capacity and whether someone that's going to hit the ground running, right? If it's going to be barriers to entries and issues. Finances is always a big one. So what we've seen in the last few years is a lot of uh, software companies to fill that void and to create capital and create credit programs for code schools specifically for students to attend, right? But the fees for the annual percentage is really high in many instances. Scholarships is available. But the major piece that's lacking, obviously, is is that you need this technical talent to fill it. There's huge demand, 100,000 plus across the country. Visa program is capped, what, at 65, 70,000. So it doesn't matter even if you increase the visa. That's That might be a solution. I believe, personally, we believe that no better to fill these jobs and folks who have served their country have these soft skills, internationally trained, can lead teams, can build teams from out of nowhere, out of scratch, ingenuity, ingeniousness, and just really grow any organization. They're just missing those technical, those hard skills. And so what we're finding is a lot of success with veterans throughout the country have gone to code school, been very successful landing jobs at companies. In some instances, they already have, they still have their clearances, right? So being picked up as federal contractors, working at software companies who want to do business with the federal government, and those are all great things. It's a plus plus. And, you know, I think that part of Solder is serving your country and patriotism. And I think this is a good way for as a post-military career to be able to continue serving your country and making sure we're at the cusp of innovation by being a software developer, making sure, you know, we build great technology companies right here at home. Yeah, that's great, man. I mean, what a phenomenal opportunity for the veterans out there that are interested in getting into coding, even if they don't have any coding experience right now. I mean, if you're still in, you know, you could start working on building your expertise in coding if you want to get into it. I mean, knowing that this opportunity is out there. So I do want to take a quick break here to thank our sponsor, USAA. And obviously, I've been a USA member for over 26 years. And we were talking beforehand, David, you're also a USA member and have been for quite a while, right? Yeah, since I was enlisted private, I used the USA and always used them and just never would think twice of going anywhere else. We had an incident once. I was driving my friend's, my sister-in-law's car, and the tire popped, and she didn't have any spares, anything extra. And I called USA, and within like 15 minutes, they were at our location using the geolocation service that they have. That's awesome. I mean, just last week, our oldest son's car First, he blew the right front tire one day. The next day, he blew the left front <laughs> front tire. So we had to use him two days in a row for that. But I'm going to hit pause here for a second and uh, so we can uh, thank USA, our sponsor, and then we'll be right back. In my 26 years as a USAA member, we logged nine PCS moves and four overseas deployments, with two of those being combat tours in Iraq. Not to mention all of the exercises and training debts over the years, all in the interest of combat readiness. Maintaining readiness is an absolute must. You've probably heard readiness thousands of times during your military training. When you're planning to leave the military, readiness may be the key to a successful transition in your financial security. As an organization created by military members for military members, USAA is committed to making your transition from the military a financial success. To learn more, visit USAA's separations tools and advice at veteranonthemove.com slash leaving the military. All right, welcome back. We're talking with David Molina, founder of Operation Code. So David, take us through the thought process and and what was going on when you were experiencing your issues using your GI Bill to go to coding school and how you arrived at the idea for Operation Code and what Operation Code's doing today. Yeah, I applied uh, to code school and couldn't. I got accepted, uh, dev boot camp, started a league up in Chicago, really great. Um, I considered the Flatiron Code School 
bought a home in Portland and then with the intent to leave my family and then go back to code school. And it turns out that I couldn't use my GI Bill. No one knew about it. Uh, we're still working on it. They were still working on getting their state accreditation at the time, 2012, 13. And so I started a company to be able to send myself to code school. And over the period of 2013 into 14, I attended as a scholarship recipient, RailsCon. I attended uh, Cascadia Ruby, uh, Ruby on Ales in Bend, Oregon, and really, you know, sort of immersed myself in the Ruby community here in Portland, as I did in Baltimore before I came home, before I got off active duty. And I really fell in love with sort of the open source piece and building and, and hacking and learning by doing. Since I couldn't go to code school, I had to sort of use meetups and go to conferences. And this is sort of how I learned. And it was like a fire hose, really, fire hose by learning. And it was really difficult and tough, but you sort of go with it. And, and it was really an awesome journey, if anything else. But in 2014, I was at a conference in Portland called Cascadia Ruby, Ruby developers from across the Pacific Northwest region. And I was there and I was sharing with fellow Rubyists and other developers, uh, Whitney, Maureen, and others local to the scene and sort of shared this sort of problem that I was facing with not being able to use my GI Bill to go to code school and wanting to build this app. And I had already tried in 2013 with another buddy. It didn't really work out. But what I felt what was a sort of paralysis by analysis, I felt that I couldn't build a site because I have the technical skill sets to build a Ruby app, a Rails app, something where somebody would sign up. As soon as they sign up, you would be able to tweet to their member of Congress based on the zip code what, you know, I want to use my GI Bill to go to code school. Please support our cause. And so I fell sort of in this problem. And what other Rubyists sort of informed me is like, just you already know how to use Ruby on Rails. You know how to use and create landing pages from it minimum. Just go ahead and do that and just take the data in somewhere else. So we use another application to take in data and built this sort of landing page that did just that. We want to use our GI Bill to go to code school. If you believe that, sign up. And so before I knew it, this was in August of 2014. It was an open source project in my personal repository, in my personal projects. And sort of built this thing and it grew just myself, the only one that I knew of that wanted to use the GI Bill to go to code school, to two, to three, to four. Before I knew it, I had a, a James Davis, a Cav Scout, you know, Desert Storm uh, veteran who is out in Louisiana who reached out and says, Dave, how can I help? And the first thing I asked was, can you help me take this site over here that takes in data and take it in and build it over here? And he's like, yeah, it's active record and it's Rails, it's super easy. And what took me like literally two years to sort of think through this took him like two hours, right? And before I knew it, I had a pull request from him to say, hey, accept these merges, accept these changes to the code base and you're off to the races, right? And so he became my first sort of Ruby mentor. And by the fall of 2014, others were asking for the same thing. Hey, you know, who's training you? Who's mentoring you? Or I'm looking for a mentor in JavaScript. And that sort of spun off the software mentor protege program. James was our first sort of director of that mentorship program. And, you know, by the fall of 2014, this thing has sort of picked up. One veteran had written a blog post, why veterans will make excellent programmers when they can use a GI Bill by Charles Sight. And this led to more press into more coverage by the local media here in the North, in Portland, Oregon, Univision, Como, and everybody asking the same question, like, how is this humanly possible that our government has left our veterans behind, right? And in a sort of day where modern web technologies is and coding is all around us, right? The president's talking about JavaScript and you know, all these things that the White House is doing, and yet our veterans are being left behind. And so that led to us creating the scholarship program, which evolved pretty quickly. At that point, we started getting scholarship tickets to go to my favorite conference, Ruby on Ales, and we sent veterans there. More veterans started signing up, and mentors start, veterans started saying, hey, is there a better way to mentor veterans? And one bottleneck we had, Joe, at the time was this issue where I was pairing software developers with veterans who had joined by email, right? And so if a veteran wanted to learn Ruby on Rails, I would pair them with somebody who was an expert in Ruby on Rails and be paired by email, right? With the straight up curriculum that was open source. And these two guys would be able to go at it. By 2015, early 2015, this became a little unwieldy. And a fellow Rubyist, Fernando Paredes, had sort of said and volunteered his efforts and said, hey, what if we take this thing and do it online, peer to peer, which led us to sort of adopt Slack as real-time communication app in a way in which a veteran joins, and now he's got another person in the same channel communicating back and forth and sharing military experiences, sharing their software programming pursuits and journeys, and you're no longer relying on somebody email coming back, right? That was a bottleneck we had with email, and now it's just you know peer-to-peer, -peer. and that has really taken off. 
And he built a bot that basically made it automatic. So it freed me up from copy and pasting data from one database to another. And he created a bot. Once a veteran signs up to operation code, basically two emails. One is a welcome email from the application, the Rails app, for myself. The second one is the bot, right? The Slack invite that leads them into to operation code. And so this thing sort of evolved. And so the software mentorship really took off. The scholarship program really took off. And more event, more volunteers really started joining at that point. Rick, more recently, he's been our director of software mentorship program. Nell Shemrell has taken all the scholarship program and being the scholarship chair. And Maggie has come on board as employer services and sort of lead the fellowship program. Christina, John, and Ming has sort of helped us sort of develop their web apprenticeship program. Really, Christina has taken off on deploy and does some awesome work there for, for clients and other folks who are asking us to support them and getting military veterans to write code for their applications, all while continuing to sort of continue our eyes on the prize, which is this problem of the GI Bill and code schools. And so those are really more challenging, uh, more regulatory. They really bog you down. And so we've had to enlist help from others who are subject matter experts in sort of legislative policy and that work up in the East Coast. So we have a small team working there. But it's been a phenomenal ride. And it's been just, you know, what started off as one line of code in August 2014. Today is now 30 contributors, veterans learning and writing code in the Rails app, making changes, the director of software mentorship program and the core team accepting those changes, really open sourcing the entire the project so that anyone can learn the code using operation code as, as sort of a platform and creating additional repositories and writing code to additional projects all within operation code so that, you know, meanwhile, the GI Bill gets going, we can get going ourselves. Okay, so if a veteran or somebody out there from the veteran community wants to join Operation Code, how do they go about doing that? And then what's going to happen and how is Operation Code going to help them get started? So first, the veteran would have to, and whether they're in Afghanistan, Germany deployed, or my brother-in-law is in Germany, or they're at Fort Bragg, doesn't matter, right? If they're in the Guard Reserve, transitioning from the Pentagon, doesn't matter. They go to operationcode.org and they click on the Join button. That will lead them to enter some credentials, you know, sort of their email, pick a password, and then certify that they do indeed have served in the military and do wish to learn to code and joining Operation Code. That's all that's required. At that point, they're going to get two emails, one from Slack, which is our bot, send them an invite. They're going to accept that invitation and going to lead it to Slack. They're going to pick a username. You know, my username, for example, is my first name. Some of us are first name, maybe last name, make it long. You can pick whatever you want. Some people pick their Twitter handle. It doesn't really matter. But you pick a username and that leads you into our sort of general commons, right? Our, our area in Slack, which is a, think of it as an app, a real-time communication app. So if you served in the army and you remember S1Net and S3Net, very similar to that, right? Questions and answers by anybody in the world who's connected, had their CAT card inserted and was enrolled in that, in that application. Very similar, right? And at that point, they can choose to pick whatever channels they're interested in. Uh, we find that a lot of veterans more recently are really interested in Android development, really interested in iOS, so they can pick those channels. They can search by channels. We have a well of 55 channels right now in Slack. So let's say they pick Android, they jump in Android and they welcome us, you know, say hello to the community and say, hey, I'm Johnny and I'm in, you know, I want to learn Android development. What do you guys suggest? And you might have Danny who works at Foursquare jump in and, you know, answer that question or Fernando, who's an iOS Android developer, jump in or other their peers, right? Say, hey, I've been learning this way, right? And so it becomes sort of a peer-to-peer -peer community where anyone can really jump in and support you. The area of military veterans who want to go to code school, that's a big thing, right? And so the usually questions come up like that, right? Like, hey, what code school accepts the GI Bill or which code school is any code school in my area in Florida? And people just jump in, right? There might be somebody coming in from Austin, Texas, because they're near, you know, they're near out of, they used to be with fourth ID or whatnot. And so you might have folks out in the Texas area say, hey, we just created a San Antonio channel or Austin channel. Welcome to join us here. And that way we can maybe organize the local meetups or local operation code meetups or whatnot. So it's really more of a peer-to-peer -peer and you don't have to be physically based in that location. You can be still deployed, you can still be in the Guard or Reserves, you can be on drill weekend. The good thing about Slack is that it's both web-based, so you can log in using the web browser, Safari, Chrome. It's also uh, native to your MacBook, so iOS, right? So you download the Slack app onto your MacBook. If you have an iPhone or Android, it's also iPhone and Android capable. So you can always have it on your phone. So if you have both it on your computer and also on your phone, you're always connected to the community. Uh, you can always ping any one of us in leadership. If there's an issue or question, you can ping your peers about you know, learning the new language. We have several channels, Joe, that we're pretty excited about. One is Eloquent JS. 
which is a study group internally to learn Eloquent JS. We have one in Free Code Camp. So very similar to people learning on Free Code Camp, we have one internally to our Slack. So if veterans who are learning and they're learning by groups, you know, they could sort of ping each other and ask questions. Another one that just started is really exciting. What we're most excited about is Exorcism. It's a open source project that helps folks get coding and really solving real world problems in various different languages from Ruby iOS. It's founded by a GitHuber named Katrina Owens. And so we started that. One of our scholarship chair really led the charge on that and said, hey, we got to find another way to connect with exorcism. And so we created this study group. And now we have, you know, well over a dozen veterans in there learning by doing right in exorcism. And so it really walks you through not only, you know, running your tests, but ensuring your tests fail, right? That's the whole goal, right? Because once they fail, then you can move forward. And you know that proceeding forward is, is going to be better and it's a better solution, right? So fail fast, right? So it's really excited about exorcism. We got free code camp and eloquent JS. Uh, the other piece that's really equally exciting is our operationcode.org is entirely open source. And so we have a number of beginner-friendly issues in there that are well-marked and tagged in GitHub. So if a veteran is still overseas or here in CONUS, and he's like, well, you know what? I don't know anything about coding. I know nothing about it, but I really want to learn Ruby on Rails. Well, Operation Code is exactly that. It's an open source project. So they can go to our GitHub and identify beginner-friendly issues. There might be one that says, hey, we need to make this color from red to green, right? Very simple. And you just pick that issue, you comment in it and say, hey, I want to solve that problem. And before you know it, the core team is answering you back and saying, great, go ahead and uh, work on that change and you know, submit it up and if test pass, then we're good to go. And so we have a number of an increase. We've seen an uptick in contributions from non-core team, non-contributors to really the community and updating the code base. We're seeing a lot of momentum and initiative from within Operation Code, as you might expect from folks who've led the charge in their own units. And creating, you know, everything from, you know, we have now a new project that just started called Open Troops, a way for us to identify great open source projects that veterans can get hacking and building on, right? That led was by Conrad, right? Our operations officer internally are. And we have one called Troops Decoders, which is sort of a one pager, real simple. What is coding? What is open source? How do you get started? What's the pay? What's this look like, right? And so that initiative, that idea was brought up by Jamil, a Marine veteran out of uh, the Silicon Beach area. And so we have a number of different issues and programs going all at the same time, and it's pretty exciting. All while we have the open source piece, we do have to recognize that there are regulatory compliance we have to do as a nonprofit. Legally, we're a nonprofit. And so we have to be able to sustain these operations, sustain staffing levels and increase staffing levels to be able to serve more military veterans. Right now, unfortunately, without really a large budget or staffing, we just can't hit up every geography in the country, even though we'd love to, right? Create these programs on a physical presence. We're just not able to because of funding levels, right? We're just not there. We just brought on our, our first hire here, a grant writer development officer out of Southern California. Uh, so she'll be working with us remotely, which is awesome because as we are remote, just like software is built, uh, anyone can really around the globe volunteer as a software mentor. Anybody around the globe can join. And anybody around the globe can really join our team and contribute to the success of Operation Code because we're remote, because we're decentralized. That is really our operating environment. And it's very much an operating environment that we're all in the military used to right? So it's really a no-brainer, and we're pretty excited about the development. Wow, that's incredible. Dude, that's a massive amount of information that you're putting out. That's incredible. So essentially, Operation Code, if you're still in or you're a new veteran and you're into coding, you want to get into coding, you want to be around people, like-minded people, Operation Code is your tribe. And the beauty of it is you can join for free and be surrounded by these other veteran coders that can guide you and help you along your way, whether you're working on individual projects or you're trying to figure out how you want to get there. What an opportunity just to be around like-minded people. Unfortunately, Dave, we're getting close to the end of our time here. I would like to give you the last word, one more plug for Operation Code, if you would. And then after that, maybe just throw something in there about if you're talking to that guy that's still in, that's maybe at the beginning of their transition or they're in the middle of the transition or maybe they didn't like where they landed right after they just transitioned. Like, you know, if you could stress the importance of being around like-minded people and finding that tribe and essentially what we would call networking. Yeah, we have a lot of Air Force. We basically are represented by all branches of the military. We have all branches of the military in Operation Code, uh, both Guard and Reserve. We have many military uh, spouses as well who are learning. What we believe in is that you shouldn't have to pay whether, you know, money to learn to code, whether it's software mentorship, online pair programming. We do it here for free. We believe that veterans military all of us have already served our country. And so this is a way of us saying thank you, right? 
And so there should be no charge at all. We don't charge for any of our meetups. We don't charge people to come to conferences. If you get a scholarship ticket, you're going, you know, we're still working on lodging and travel and those kinds of things. As a nonprofit, we've got to raise money for those things. We're raising money for our send veterans to code school. So those are pieces. So first and foremost, they've already served their country. They're not going to pay a dime, right? They've already served. And that's is our way of saying thank you, particularly to spouses as well, who've also served their country and served alongside their, their spouse. And so we welcome them as well. The bigger piece is, as an organization, we are having to become sustainable, right, to be able to increase our geography and expand. And so part of that is offering to technology companies and veteran-run companies uh, a fellowship. Basically, one of our fellows can be deployed to your location for a six-month paid placement with you as a fellow, and we work with you to do that through our, our employer services. And so, so that's one piece we're doing while creating a pipeline, a military veterans pipeline for our military veterans to get into companies that are doing great things that are changing the world. The other component is if military veterans out there who have startups and they just have this great idea, but they just don't know how to get this thing tested, built, deployed into the web, our deploy program led by our military veterans and in-house uh, can do that dev work for you, right? And so those are two things that could really be supportive of us, not only for the military veterans pipeline, but also to get our vet military veterans coding and getting paid to do real world projects. Those are the plugs that I want to just drop. But first and foremost, I want to thank you for the opportunity. Joe has been phenomenal to share our story with Operation Code with the world. Keep in mind that you know, Operation Code is free now and it will always be free, right? We've already served our country and this is our way for to introduce military veterans to make sure they do not get left behind in the 21st century. I found that incredibly difficult and challenging when I got out in 2012, 13. Uh, we want to make sure that no one ever faces that feeling ever again. And so folks are joining every day. This is their tribe, this is their community. And just because they served in the infantry or the Coast Guard or the Air Force doesn't really matter. If they've served in any branch of our military, any period in any conflict zone, CONUS or OCONUS, doesn't really matter. But they have an interest in software development. They have an interest in mentoring fellow military veterans in software development and get them coding to land a job at a software company and change the world with software. Then I don't see any other place. I can't think of any other place than Operation Code to start that journey. All right, David. I wish I could talk with you about this for hours, man, because I'm I was into coding back in the days when it was uh, basic, Pascal, and Fortran. Of course, I've moved on to other things that I would have loved to have had the coding opportunity that lays in front of us right now, you know, when I was younger. You know, what an opportunity for veterans and especially with Operation Code there to help them along the way. So if you're out there listening to this and you're interested in getting into coding, definitely uh, go to operationcode.org and check it out. And if you're interested, join and then... Uh, if you join and you get into Operation Code, I'd love to hear back from you. And I'm not sure David would love to hear from you too also about how it's going and, and what's going on inside Operation Code. So, David, thanks once again. Appreciate you sharing your entrepreneurial success story. And these two veterans are Oscar Mike. Be sure to check out Thrive15.com, the world's premier online education platform that helps entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs learn how to start or grow a successful business. Start your free 30-day membership by going to thrive15.com and use the promo code VETERAN. Thank you for listening to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. So until next time, this veteran is Oscar Mike.